It's wonderful to uh, greet everyone who's joined this special webinar. Uh, I want to give a special greeting to all of you uh, from the United Nations and UNITAR, the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, the Global Surgery Foundation, Operation Smile, and Stellenbosch University, who are all partnering together for this webinar, uh, Restarting Non-Emergent Surgery in Low- and Middle-Income Countries. A very, very important topic, and we have a wonderful lineup of speakers today. And I would like to just turn it over to Kate Telenko from Operation Smile, who is our special moderator today. And she will introduce our speakers and moderate the session. So thank you very much for joining us. And uh, please participate through the chat line and question and answers as we go through. And Kate and I will try to answer some of those questions uh, during the conversation and uh, there'll be opportunity for interaction a little bit later. So Kate, I'll turn it over to you, thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. And first I wanna thank Julia, Megan, Rachel, the speakers and everyone who helped put this webinar together. So I'm Dr. Kate Telenko, I'm a pediatrician and health workforce specialist. I'm the former head of the US government's Global Health Workforce Project and I've been helping Operation Smile with our global education and training strategy. Operation Smile for close to 40 years has been improving essential surgery systems in low and middle income countries through the lens of cleft surgery. And during the past six months of the COVID pandemic, Operation Smile has been working in its 30 partner countries to help strengthen hospital responses to COVID. But certainly now six months in, hospitals are getting used to the new normal. Hospitals are able to provide better levels of personal protective equipment and have done their infection prevention and control training and now they're looking at restarting the non-emergent surgery, which had been paused for six months. Because as people are looking at morbidity and mortality during COVID, there's increasing concern that morbidity and mortality from delayed surgery may start to exceed the morbidity and mortality of, of COVID. And both the American College of Surgeons and the UK Royal College of Surgeons have put out guidelines for uh, restarting surgery in the time of COVID. Also, the University of Chicago has put out the medically ne necessary time-sensitive prioritization uh, worksheet, which helps surgeons prioritize what uh, surgeries they should do during COVID. However, all of these uh, approaches have been designed in high-income countries. So how do surgeons in low- and middle-income countries decide when to start surgery and what surgeries to prioritize? So those are some of the questions that we hope to answer today. And we're aware there's a lot of information out there on the internet. And so we hope that here today, we can help you synthesize it, get your questions answered, and think about how you'd like to apply a lot of these ideas to your own hospital. So we have four speakers today, uh, and each has about 10 to 15 minutes to present. And then as Jeff mentioned, we'll have questions and answers afterwards. So uh, with no further ado, I'll introduce our first speaker, who is Dr. Sanjay Nagral. So Dr. Nagral is a surgical gastroenterologist with a special interest in liver transplantation and ethics. And currently he's the director of the Department of Surgical Gastroenterology at Jaslock Hospital and the head of the Department of General Surgery at Bob Hall Municipal Hospital, Mumbai. And he's been teacher and guide for multiple fellowship training programs and postgraduate sur surgical training programs. Dr. Nagral has over 110 publications in peer-reviewed journal articles and has uh, published four textbook chapters. And he's a member of the Executive Council of the Declaration of Istanbul Custodian Group, a global group devoted to ethics around uh, transplantation surgery. He's also the publisher and chair of the editorial board of the Indian Journal of Medical Ethics and the chairperson of the Indian Forum of Medical Ethics. And in addition to his academic work, uh, Dr. Nagral um, writes and publishes widely, including in some of the major, uh, uh, major newspapers in India. So please, Dr. Nagral. Thank you. So uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Okay, great. So first of all, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, UNITAR. Thank you to all the uh, organization supporting this uh, seminar uh, for this opportunity. Uh, I think it's a matter of uh, a special and unique privilege to be talking to surgeons uh, in these unprecedented uh, times, uh, surgeons across the globe. And of course, amongst the many challenges that uh, we face as healthcare workers, uh, 
one of them is uh, is restarting uh, surgical procedures uh, of course there are many logistic issues but what i hope to do in uh, my presentation is focus a little more on uh, from from a ethics lens because that's uh, area of uh, interest for me and of course when i say ethics we will be of course taking a very broad wider definition of ethics and not just a very uh, narrow definition so here's the uh, plan that i uh, that i hope to use uh, for my for my presentation uh, next slide please so one of the things that we must uh, pause and look at uh, before we jump into the discussion proper is why was or why is elective surgery stopped during the covid pandemic and of course it is about uh, uh, using resources for uh, the covid patients we all know that it's about infection to personnel which is a big issue uh, and of course we need to remember that uh, covid patients and even non covid uh, patients have uh, increased uh, mortality and morbidity in the post operative period and we'll we'll look at some of these issues in a little bit detail later but I, what i wanted to immediately point out is the fact that this distinction between emergency uh, elective uh, essential these are all terms which are relative and uh, whilst we need to have some definitions but these could change from country to country especially in lmics because we already have pre existing delayed presentation so what is elective in some countries uh, can actually be be essential in in, in certain countries uh, next slide please so here's a, a quick look at the the background pre existing challenges in lmics and uh, many of you know this so i'm not going to discuss all of them in detail we wrote this piece for the bmj a few years back with surgeons from across south asia and my talk is uh, it has is going to have a little bit of south asian bias because that that's where i work uh, and we actually looked at what was the biggest challenge to surgery in south asia and it was really the unmet need for surgery so uh, there is the pre existing unmet need then of course there are dysfunctional health systems there is a fair amount of stigmatization in our cultures around covid uh, we also have a peculiar situation uh, especially in south asia of a of a parallel dominant uh, but very unregulated private sector and finally of course the ethical and uh, oversight is pretty pretty weak in in this part of the world next slide and here's mumbai here's my city and uh, you know you mumbai is a big city 22 million at the last count uh, we have seen 1.2 million covid cases so it's been very much at the epicenter of the epidemic in india around 8000 to 8500 deaths uh, till today with probably an us underestimate but what what really happened in mumbai in the early months is is the fact that uh, hospitals emerged that as hot spots uh, including both the hospitals i work uh, and there were closure of several hospitals so surgical services actually stopped uh, for some time in in the city in a large number of hospitals then hospitals have been divided as covid and uh, and non covid uh, there's been a lot of problems with, with transport in fact in the early days we had a situation of patients dying uh, in ambulances waiting for beds uh, with uh, with lots of emergency problems uh, so we have two systems and two worlds in this part of the of 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 the globe and i'm just showing you this picture to explain that so we, here's one hospital i work on top which is the which is a private sector specialty hospital next to that is uh, which is the house of the richest man in india which is a, a 60 story building so he lives with a family of four in that so that's the kind of wealth you can have uh, and i cross this uh, bridge across the bay in mumbai to work uh, in this hospital here which is one of the large public hospitals of mumbai and this is the population we serve in that hospital 60% of mumbai lives in slums and uh, that's a very specific challenge one of the peculiar things that is now emerging is that the private sector is keen to start surgery because it's revenue for them whereas the public sector has been completely overwhelmed by covid and therefore they are extremely reluctant to start surgical procedures next slide please now here are some factors which are unique to surgery in covid again most of you know this 
We already discussed the post-operative problems. But COVID, of course, uh, uh, for a surgical team, there is a specific issue of the operation theater exposure. And uh, most many surgeries have a lot of aerosol generation. So there are specific safety issues. And there is already some emerging data from across the world. The famous uh, Kobe surge uh, study, which is uh, published recently in the Lancet, and that's a HIC study, really, it's high income countries, I think one or two countries from LMICs, uh, which showed 28% mortality in COVID patients. I've just put some data from Mumbai. Uh, one of them is uh, up for publication. One of them is unpublished, uh, which looked at what happened in uh, some of the institutions here. And well, big cancer hospital in Mumbai has operated 412 patients with no mortality, with only six of them were COVID positive. So uh, there is a lot of uh, variety of data that we're going to see from across the world, depending on which part of the world it comes from. Next slide, please. Uh, now, what is essential surgery? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenging term because it means many things to many people. But of course, you have a, a cancer, which obviously needs early surgical interventions. But you could have a necessity for essential surgery for pure symptoms. So pain, bleeding, you know, abscesses, which need to be drained early, prostatic enlargements, which are huge, which cause urinary retention. So this is all very essential from the patient's viewpoint. Of course, a lot of surgery relieves disabilities, so you have fractures and improved quality of life. And for uh, our patients in LMICs, uh, whether it's blindness due to cataract, whether it's reversal of stomas, they're all quality of life issues which actually need uh, fairly urgent attention. And of course, there is this group of, uh, of surgical diseases which needs uh, interventions because if you end up with a complication, then you're gonna have a much worse time in terms of the treatment. Uh, I'm just now going to come to the next slide, please. So I'm going to come to the ethics lens. And I think the ethics lens is important because it gives you a, a global universal value of how we approach the problems of uh, uh, restarting uh, surgical services. So public health ethics is clear about one uh, a certain principle, which is the equal moral worth of individuals and justice in a, in a health emergency. Now, of course, on the ground, it operates in a very different way. But I think the ethics lens is important to all of us uh, across countries as an overarching lens to approach the, some of the dilemmas that we're going to face. We must also keep in mind in LMICs, there is extreme vulnerability, uh, the information asymmetry, and our countries can be very hierarchical. So there is discrimination already inbuilt in the system. And therefore, the ethics lens, uh, which constantly reminds you of the need for justice to everybody is extremely important. Next slide, please. Uh, so what are the ethical challenges? Uh, in my view, the first and the basic challenge, which I refer to is, is the fact that there is denial of surgery. That's by itself uh, is, is a big, big ethics challenge. And I mean, we have had a lot of collateral damage uh, in our country of patients dying, waiting for procedures like abdominal emergencies. Then of course, the question of prioritization and rationing um, because of the resource limitations due to COVID. And there are various ways to prioritize. And I, again, these are all standard ways. Many of you know this, but of course we can use uh, the tricky areas like what is productive value uh, of, a, of a citizen or an individual when you talk about long-term gain. Uh, the, should age be the only criteria? And of course, we must keep in mind that in a, many LMICs, including my part of the world, gender is a very important issue. We also have the issue of the safety of the patient versus the safety of the staff. And here there is an ethical principle involved of reciprocity prosity, which is that, of course, whilst the there is a commitment to offer treatment, provide treatment, there's also a commitment to provide uh, safety to the healthcare workers. Next slide, please. Uh, we come, of course, to the, the big question of uh, informed consent. Now, how informed is informed consent is a debate even in normal times. In LMICs, there is a debate of, about how much to disclose, even in routine times. And uh, the fact is that in LMICs, uh, the extent of disclosure uh, can vary from cultures to culture. Uh, there is, of course, a big role of the family in our part of the world. Uh, there have been the old barriers to informed consent, but we have now a new barrier, which is the barrier of communication in COVID times. So you have uh, people wearing PPEs, masks, masks. Uh, we have social distancing and isolation, and it's emerged as a 
huge problem in in mumbai because most hospitals do not allow family members now to be present in the peri operative period and that's leading to huge trust problems and huge practical problems that patients are facing of course what is recommended is the use of digital and audio visual devices but how much can these replace the actual face to face discussions and connect with family members is an open question next slide please uh and i think this is my uh, last slide which uh, tries to look at the way forward uh, for the for all of us uh, as we approach this problem uh, one of the things is of course to incorporate uh, universal ethical values and framework in the in the policy making and prioritization i think that's that's a good overarching uh, thing to keep in mind we need leadership from uh, professional organizations and i must say this that in our part of the world uh unfortunately organizations have currently focused on protection of the healthcare workers but we need to be patient advocates because the collateral damage that our patients are undergoing is best known to us uh we of course need to promote shared decision making and uh, and there need to be uh, clinical ethics committees in in institutions ethics committees in in india largely deal with research ethics and do not really look at other issues so i just leave you with this message of this figure here which essentially says that we need to do this uh, fine balance or tight rope walk between the need for essential surgery on the other hand the safety of the healthcare workers and and of course the safety of the patient given the cultural and socio cultural background of lmics uh, thank you for your attention Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Negral. I especially love that last slide of yours showing that, that sort of three-way tension between the, the need for the surgery, the safety of the patient, and the safety of the, the healthcare worker. That was very helpful. So our next speaker is Dr. Catherine Chu, and Dr. Chu is a colorectal surgeon and professor of global surgery in the Department of Global Health at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. And she is currently the Vice President of Doctors Without Borders South Africa and is on the board of directors of One to One Africa, a nonprofit organization that provides mentor mothers with HIV positive pregnant women. And previously, Dr. Chu worked for the University of Rwanda with the Human Resources for Health program to train Rwandan surgeons. Dr. Chu's research focuses on equitable access to essential surgery for Africa with a particular focus on strengthening surgical capacity at district hospitals. And Dr. Chu is also, she's also conducted research on improving quality of care for humanitarian surgical delivery. And we're especially excited to have Dr. Chu here because uh, South Africa has the largest COVID uh, outbreak in Sub-Saharan Africa. And you know, very similar to, to India, the South African system has both world-class private hospitals, but also struggling public hospitals. So please, Dr. Chu. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, good afternoon and good morning to all the of you on the call. And I'm um, very pleased and I would to be a part of this uh, webinar. And I would just like to thank UNITAR, the Global Surgery Foundation, and Operation Smile for asking me to participate. Um, oh, I think the lighting is not great. Um, so the, I think my talk kind of segues nicely from Dr. Negral's because a lot of the things he mentioned that were happening in South Asia are also happening here in Africa. Um, and so, you know, just to highlight a few things, but they are quite similar, is that pre-COVID, surgical access is extremely limited in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, you know, long waiting lists already existed. Um, access, especially for rural populations, um, was really quite poor. And as Kate mentioned, there's a large inequity in Sub-Saharan Africa. And since March, when the um, pandemic hit Sub-Saharan Africa, um, and specifically South Africa, there's been a drastic reduction in elective operations. And um, by one estimate um, done by COVID Surge um, Collaborative, 28 million operations have been canceled wor worldwide and need to be done in the next sort of 12 weeks, or 28 million operations secondary to 12 weeks of the pandemic um, will occur. And that's a huge number. Um, and then just a little bit of background here in South Africa. So we have over 40% of all the cases in Sub-Saharan Africa. At the moment, I think these statistics were from a few days ago, we are 
almost up to half a million cases. We have about 12,000 new cases a day. Um, interestingly, our mortality so far is quite low, only 2%. Um, next slide. So just wanted to first um, mention that in March in South Africa, and I think several countries in Sub-Saharan Africa followed suit, that we actually had a national lockdown when we only had 20 cases. And this was to prepare for the pandemic. You know, the pandemic came to high income countries like the US, uh, European countries, and we saw their health systems overwhelmed. But we here in Sub-Saharan Africa didn't know what would happen here. And so the, the national government um, took a very strong policy to, to have a national lockdown, uh, which, it, which essentially um, disallowed all movement within the country that was non-essential. Um, and that included a real discouragement to attend healthcare facilities except for emergencies. And, um, you know, there's obviously a large interpretation, as Dr. Negral says, of what is an emergency and what are sort of urgent um, health conditions. But here in South Africa, we saw a huge decrease in the number of outpatient visits, emergency room visits for all kinds of conditions. And then there was been a real question of, you know, what's happened to all the stroke patients? What's happened to all the heart attacks? Um, we did our own survey here in South Africa. We did a national survey of surgeons who worked in 85 different hospitals, which we think represented about 20% of hospitals nationwide. And it showed what you probably would expect. 99% of elective operations and outpatient visits were canceled or reduced. And a third of hospitals had at least one operating room um, repurposed as an ICU ventilated bed, which I found was very interesting. So in the beginning of our pandemic, this was all done in preparation for COVID cases, but none had actually occurred. Then later in May and June, as the pandemic truly hit South Africa, um, elective cases remained unoperated on because then our hospitals became overwhelmed. And I think that the question um, for this webinar, the title was re-escalation re of elective surgery, restarting elective operations. But I would like to actually maybe rephrase that to saying, how do we reprioritize or how do we prioritize the surgical cases that we're going to do now? Because as Dr. Negral says, in our part of the world, in LMICs, there are really no truly elective operations in the public sector in particular. And so it's just shades of gray of how urgent um, the operation is. Yes, there's some ones that are very obvious, like life-threatening or limb-threatening um, procedures that need to be done. But otherwise, you know, many other cases need to be done urgently, meaning ideally before they leave the hospital, but maybe not tomorrow. Um, and so I think that that's now where we're at in South Africa, is how do we factor in what's happening with COVID? How do we factor in with what our hospital resources are in order to decide which operation should proceed? Because there's no doubt where we are, we, we are not going to go back up to 100% of where we were in terms of surgical volume for a long time. Um, and in the private and the public sectors are varying in that, but even in the private sector, they still are not able to go up to 100%. So then what are the case, What are the factors that we need to consider? And Kate mentioned numerous guidelines that have been published by high income countries around this. And how does that relate for us here in Sub-Saharan Africa or in LMICs? Well, first of all, some of them do apply to us. So local COVID factors. Are your daily cases still increasing? You know, most people would say if they're still increasing, you probably should not even consider restarting elective surgery because you don't know how high that curve is going to go. If they're plateauing or if they're decreasing, then I think there can be some consideration. What about your hospital capacity? How many beds are being used by COVID cases? If more than 50% of your hospital beds are being operated by COVID cases and there just really aren't extra beds for surgical patients, again, probably a consideration not to restart. Um, shortage of surgical staff. So here in the Western Cape, we have some hospitals where, um, or in our province, where over 2,000 staff are out sick with COVID. So that is, you know, a huge um, portion of our surgical workforce. So then we're not really able to restart. And then also, as Dr. Negral mentioned, the safety of the healthcare workers. If there's not appropriate PPE for surgical staff, especially for the anesthesiologists, then one really shouldn't reconsider starting. So in the U.S., um, surgeons wear PAPRs, so this positive ventilation. It almost looks like a spacesuit that the orthopedic surgeons used to wear for joint replacements. You know, we don't have any of that here uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. So what is safe for our part of the world? 
And then the last point I would really like to discuss a bit is the ability to test preoperative patients for COVID. So that varies between countries. Here in South Africa and the public se sector, only in, until, recent, until recently, the turnaround time for testing was 10 days. And so even if we were able to test, we couldn't do much with the information on the emergency patients. For elective cases, it still wasn't practical because if you tested your patient, where were you going to put them for 10 days while you were waiting to get the result? Um, because if you let them go home, they might become positive again in those 10 days. We don't know. Um, now the turnaround time is faster. And you know, in South Africa, we do not have national guidelines on how to, re to prioritize restarting surgery. But this is what um, I'm on a task force now to develop that because there's a real need to decide what factors do we need to consider before restarting. And COVID testing, I think, is, is, is a really essential part of that because, as Dr. Negral mentioned, the COVID collaborative published in The Lancet that night, almost a quarter of patients who underwent operations who were COVID positive, whether they had symptoms or not, ended up dying. And half of those patients had pulmonary complications. That's a huge number. Now, again, we don't know if that's going to play out as there are more numbers of patients and maybe it was because they were in hospitals that didn't separate the COVID patients from the non-COVID patients. And so perhaps there are confounding factors on why that mortality was so high. But given that, what do we advise patients? Dr. Negral mentioned the ethics of con informed consent. You know, if a patient is coming in for a semi-elective procedure like a hip replacement, would they still want it if we told them they had a one in four chance of dying at this point? Maybe not. And um, we can go to the next slide. So, you know, again, the other factor is about prioritization or escalation is who decides. So some hospitals have multidisciplinary hospital committees where every single operative case goes before the committee and the whole committee decides whether that is an appropriate case or not. In many, in many hospitals, it's the surgeon's choice. So he or she gets to decide for the patient. But in a hospital where there are multiple surgeons from different disciplines and there's limited operating time now, if you've got five surgeons all saying that their patients need to go, who now decides? And as Dr. Negral mentioned, here in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's the same as in India. We have large backlogs already. So every case now is urgent. So uh, you can go to the next slide. So then who does decide? And um, Kate brought up this um, scoring system that was published um, from, um, by American surgeons. But I would like to go over this because here in South Africa, we are revising this scoring system for our own context. And I couldn't put it up because we haven't um, validated it quite yet. But um, the, the principle is the same. So this is called the MENS score or Medically Necessary Time Sensitive Procedures. And essentially it's a scoring system to rank patients against one another to try and decide given your current resources, should you proceed or not? So if you look at the, um, the scale here, um, they've got sort of green on the left, okay to proceed. And then on the right-hand side, procedure not justified in red. And purposely, they actually don't tell you what the score numbers are, where you should draw those lines. And those lines are changeable depending on your hospital's current capacity. So, you know, for us, we've got district hospitals that might have one surgical provider and one theater, and we've got huge uh, academic hospitals with 30, 30 operating rooms and 20 to 30 surgeons. And so we want a scoring system that can actually um, be used at all these places, depending. Um, and I just want to spend a few minutes going over what it's about. Um, essentially, the MENS scoring system takes it into consideration the procedural factors, the disease factors, and the patient factors. Next slide, please. And again, I think that this scoring system needs to be redone for our context because some of these um, points are not so relevant. And um, I'm happy to share that once we get our own uh, modified mints out. But I think the points are still valid. So the procedural factors is how long is the patient going to spend in the operating room? So the longer the operation, you know, the, the more likely, you should, the more consideration that you should defer the patient. So operating time, is it going to take five hours? It's going to take 30 minutes. Um, the length of stay, so again, hospital beds is uh, really critical at this time. If it's an outpatient procedure, perhaps more likely consider it versus a large abdominal operation that might make the patient stay for seven days. ICU needs, again, if the patient's likely to need ICU, probably should reconsider blood loss. 
surgeon team size, you know, if surgeons are at a real shortage or staff are at a real shortage and you need three surgeons to do the operation, perhaps maybe you should reconsider. Intubation is a big one. Dr. Negral brought up the risk to healthcare workers with the aerosolization. If you can do the operation under local or regional, maybe a bit better. Um, and then they mentioned surgical site. Next slide. So the next one is disease factors. And I think this is the most difficult one. And this is causes the most arguments between surgeons. So essentially it's, can you, is there a non-operative treatment for your patient's disease? Probably not. Otherwise you wouldn't be arguing with their hospital committee about whether you should proceed. Um, but if you deferred for two weeks, how much worse would the condition get? So symptomatic cancers is often brought up. You know, can you delay it for two weeks? Can you delay it for six weeks? What would happen to the patient? And so, you know, this scoring system is quite subjective in some way because it says, you know, the patient's going to get worse, significantly worse, no worse. Um, and what's the data for that? So you have different surgeons trying to argue differently, but this again is, tries to make it somewhat objective. It's kind of like before we used to use, you know, does, does the patient need to go to theater in the next six hours, in the next 24 hours, in the next few days? And that, that used to be a triage system. So this is sort of like that. Next slide. And this last slide um, is the patient factors. So, um, you know, because the risk of dying, at least according to the Lancet study, is one out of four right now, it's really important to know what are the patient's underlying risk factors for mortality, morbidity anyway. So some of those are the ones that we always considered age, underlying lung disease, um, cardiac disease, diabetes seems to be a big factor now, um, and COVID risk being immunocompromised. And here on this scale, they said exposure to known COVID positive person in the last 14 days. I would argue now that that should not be on the scale because we should be pre-op testing everybody. So perhaps to take that off. Um, but essentially, you know, this is my last slide, is just to say that it is a very complex decision-making process. And then, I, you know, there are special considerations. For example, pediatric patients. You know, right now the data seems to be that children don't seem to spread COVID very much. And children seem to either have mild or asymptomatic disease. So for children that need operations, do they need to undergo the same testing and the same kind of rules as adults? I think that's something else to consider because for Operation Smile, I think you do have a large pediatric population. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, we have a large pediatric population to consider. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks so much, Dr. Chu. And I think it was especially helpful the way you went through the MENTS. Uh, that was really a uh, very helpful to understand that in more depth. So our next speaker is Dr. Hatim Drusi, and Dr. Drusi is a plastic surgeon from Marrakesh, Morocco, and he specializes in aesthetics, burns, and congenital malformations. Dr. Drusi is Deputy Secretary General of the Moroccan Society for Aesthetic and Plastic Surgeons, and Dr. Drusi has been a valued Operation Smile volunteer since 2008 and has uh, operated in over 20 surgical missions, and he's led a number of those missions. And so Dr. Drusi will give us the perspective from a middle-income country, actually a country of Morocco, which has handled its first outbreak very well, but is now starting to see a, a surge with the opening of the economy. Dr. Drusi, you might need to unmute yourself. Is that okay for you? Yes, yes. Great. So uh, thank you, everyone. Hello, everyone, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Operation Smile and uh, UNITA for the invitation. It's a real pleasure for me to be one of those great panelists to discuss this, uh, this uh, really important topics uh, on how to restart uh, safely the non-emergent surgeries in uh, LMACs, uh, I, I will say during COVID-19 because it's not over yet, unfortunately, and not, and not post COVID-19. So next one, please. <clears throat> so uh, I will go through those uh, generalities uh, really quick. So this is a worldwide infection. Uh, this, this condition has led to a numerous postponation and consolation, unfortunately. So the resources was, were redirected through uh, for pandemic preparedness and response. Uh, for the example of Morocco, 
we, we had an early and very effective response since the first case declared in the two March. So the total lockdown for the country was 18 days after. Actually, we are partially, un partially unlocked depending on cities and regions. So immediately the national government has statute that private and public hospital will have non-emergent and uh, uh, non-urgent medical and surgical operation must be postponed. Uh, they promote the teleconsultation, the enhancement of hygienic measurements in clinics and hospitals, as the WHO recommends. For the public, for the public hospitals, we get the separation between, uh, like we have special pathway, as Kate said, special pathway for non-COVID and COVID. So we have a whole hospital for COVID and the whole hospital for non-COVID patients. So there will, the, we have a low risk of cross contaminations. Next one, please. Uh, this uh, has led to accelerate the establishment of this politic to restart work in private because we have seen like uh, uh, big numbers of non-COVID pathologies uh, complications. Uh, for Moroccan, so the Moroccan Medical Council has uh, said that all scientific societies must, must make their guidelines specific to their practice. So for us, we have two plastic surgery societies in Morocco, and they had made their own guidelines inspired from those of other countries in Europe and USA and applied or adapt to our reality. The actual situation in Morocco up to the 26th of July was about uh, more than 1,900 cases and 1,600 recovered, 16,000 recovered. Death were uh, uh, 305. And the R0, the multiplication factor, was increasing last few days to reach 1.12. We have uh, uh, no statistic about impact on non-COVID pathologies care, but we see uh, in our practice that we have a high rate of complications and deaths due to non-COVID pathologies. Next one, please. Uh, so the recommendation that we have put uh, for both uh, societies are uh, like uh, segregates into organization in the office and for surgery in clinics. So for the office, we have promoted the online consultations, reservation only, no direct reservations, especially by phone or email. Uh, the temperature must be taken at home before coming. If any symptoms occurs, the patient will not, will not be able to come. If there is a contact within the 14 days before the, uh, the, day, the, the, the time of consultation, no consultation will happen. So enough empty time between two appointments to ensure the contamination of the, of the, of the office. Uh, the, uh, the, all, the, all the personnel, all the workers in the office must put mask and use alcoholic gel, uh, take the temperature of the patients when he arrived, one, uh, keep one meter at least distanciation in the waiting room, uh, keep an airflow and open windows in the upper, in, in the all the uh, the office and uh, regular decontamination after each each visit and each patients. For for the feeling of the information, we have limited the contacts with the receptionist. If uh, the, the patients feel himself the uh, all the information, and during the consultations, the, he keep his mask for body consultation, face sh shield and mask for surgeon and for facial exam and decontamination of area in tools after each patient. During local procedures, of course, face shield and mask for nurses and doctors. So for surgical patients, we have, uh, we have seen that uh, surgeries can enhance, like, uh, like uh, a lot of uh, studies shows that can enhance the severity of asymptomatic patients or symptoms in, in a mild condition that can lead to a high rate of mortality. So the goals of this, uh, of, of selecting patients for surgery is to limit the spread of the virus first, avoid exacerbation of anasymptomatic patients, and avoid getting infected in the perioperative period. So what, what we have uh, uh, set as uh, measures is that, unfortunately, we don't, we don't have first, we don't have a free access to PCR tests in Morocco. Uh, so the one who gets this PCR test is the only the, the person who gets signs of infection or the contact subjects. 
uh, we have conducted until now about 2 million tests uh, until the 27th of this July. And uh, so we decide to establish a list of exams that must be done <coughs> before surgeries. So first, uh, anamnesis on selection patients. So no, no patients was accepted if they, have negative, if they were negatively tested in less than one month or if they have contact during the last 14 days with a positive case. For the lab exams, we do a CVC, prothrombin time, kidney exploration, uh, blood ferritin and uh, dedimer as, they, uh, uh, as some studies show that, that they are co correlated to the high risk of, of complication in COVID. We, ha we, we have done, since we don't have PCR uh, accessible, we have done, we, 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 we ask the patients to do a thoracic CT scan 24, uh, 40, 48 hours before surgery because of the high specificity for positive asymptomatic case, like the, uh, the ground uh, glass uh, opacification that we can see. And uh, we will do the waiting for PCR and immunologic tests to, to, to be set in Morocco. So next one, please. For anesthesia, the factors that Dr. Chu said are discussed like between the team, surgeon and anesthesiologist. So for the type and the balance benefits risk, uh, so the anesthesiologist and the surgery team can do the, their appreciation, appreciation, appreciation and, and, and the statue that this patient could have surgery or not. Uh, those are some con considerations uh, when uh, admitting the patient. So hygienic discussed below uh, must be applied in the clinic with a special uh, pathway, preparing the room for mask and shoe cover for the, for the, for the patient, marking the patient uh, with the surgeon only, if possible, in the room, uh, and the transportation to the OR must, uh, um, must be like a special way for, uh, to, to not, to, uh, a special way to, the, to, 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 uh, to drive the, the patients to the OR. For the surgery, we're working around, uh, the working around must be limited for the teamwork only. The anesthesia and intubation with plastic cover to isolate the intubation zone. No complex surgery and no com combined ones or surgery more than four hours. Uh, for body surgery, keep the plastic cover over the intubation zone. And for face surgery, cover nose and mouth with the tegaderm, the plastic cover. Keep instruments inside the room in a plastic box. Uh, for the first decontamination inside the room, then to the sterilization zone, and keep enough time between procedures to, to ensure uh, decontamination of the OR. Uh, recovery room with more space between beds and one nurse for each patient, if possible. Next one. For the post-operatory uh, uh, time, we, we, we recommend no more than one overnight. Uh, no that private practice are out of COVID circuits in our in Morocco, so less chance to get infected or cross contamination. No visits of family are allowed, and no administrative work to do for the patients. All I have done with our assistance, so there will no, uh, there will um, the patient will not have to go to the administration to do some work, and uh, the post op dressing. Uh, is recommended to to be done at home, but a qualified nurse that we design for them. That will be all for me. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I love the, the practical level of your advice around, you know, running a surgical clinic in the time of COVID. And then that last part about the, um, the, the surgeries and, you know, the spacing of the beds and the assignment of one nurse or and doing wound care at home rather than having people come in. Very practical and very helpful. Thank you so much. So our next speaker is Mr. Ernest Gay, and uh, Mr. Gay is Operation Smile Senior Advisor for Global Business Operations. And he brings 20 years of field-based experience working with nonprofits in Sub-Saharan Africa. And Mr. Gay brings extensive expertise in designing, implementing, and managing complex and diverse teams. And Mr. Gay is a proud recipient of the Clinton Global Health Initiative Award for Outstanding Leadership and Management of AfriCare's Response to the Liberian Ebola epidemic. Ernest, brings, um, or, or Ernest also supported the Liberian Ministry of Health and other partners to rebuild the Liberian health system post-war. It was a particular champion of decentralization of that system. 
Mr. Gay holds a master's in equity studies from the University College Dublin, Ireland, and he remains active in his home country of Liberia through serving on multiple nonprofit boards, and he was appointed by the president of Liberia as a board member of the Bomi Community College in Liberia. And so we especially asked uh, Ernest Gay to, to speak to give us the perspective of what it was like to reopen services, health system services, you know, during and after the Ebola epidemic, particularly from the point of view of how you organize services, but also how you communicate to the public. Because when you think about it, for six months, we've been telling people, stay away from hospitals, stay away from health facilities, don't come in. And now you are gonna to start to say, come back in, it's safe, it's all right. So how do we commun communicate with the community to make sure that, that they believe us and that they return uh, to take advantage of the services? So please, Ernest. Thanks, Kate. Um, I'm really glad to be a part of this uh, panel and to share the same platform with such great um, panelists. I also want to um, commend um, you and the Upsmile uh, and UNITA and you know the Global uh, Surgery Foundation for organizing this uh, forum. Um, the, one of the things about speaking last on a, on a, on a topic is that um, the previous speakers may have already touched on all of your talking points. Uh, and so sometimes it's difficult to, to get in because you, it, it seems as, as though you're repeating. But um, in our particular case, you know, I wouldn't go back to discuss uh, you know, some of the things that they, they have shared already. Because um, I, I really do think that there are a lot of similarities, you know, when it comes to uh, responding to um, infectious diseases and, and the impact that they, they, they do have on health systems. And Liberia was, was a classical example, you know, a country coming out of a devastating, um, civil war, uh, it impacted every fabric of, of, of society. Um, but through it all, we had the support of the government and international development partners. And I, I just want to, to draw a parallel here uh, and share some basic um, thoughts. One, I think you know, and uh, Dr. Chu highlighted this, that is a critical challenge for a lot of uh, low income countries, uh, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, where surgery is almost seen as a luxury, uh, simply because our health systems are not capacitated to deal with uh, the surgical uh, burdens. Uh, and therefore, you know, we have like, you know, someone coming from Liberia, where some major surgeries had to be referred to out of South Africa, Ghana, Kenya, or India. Now, these are countries that are already dealing with uh, the burden of, of COVID itself. And that means that uh, people who may be queued in for surgery may not have access and cannot travel, you know, to, uh, to get the, the needed surgeries that they have. But I, I wanted to, to share that um, restarting uh, surgery uh, or restarting um, health services, one of the critical pieces, and I think what is core cool is how do you rebuild the trust and confidence in the health system itself. Because the, the, the virus or the, the, the disease itself puts undue pressure. So kid, you know, and you and I talk about this, when you, when you start off the messaging and the communication you put out is one, in the case of Ebola, we told uh, patients, come to the facility. In COVID, we're saying, please stay at home. 
So there, there are two different messages, you know, relevant based on the context and based on the need. But it also sends a message out there that, uh, well, the system is not, is not strong enough, it's not, it's not prepared. And then what happens? People often turn to alternative uh, uh, healthcare sources. And most of the times, those healthcare providers or those alternative healthcare providers are not equipped medically to deal with the situation that is on hand. So I, I think for me, that is the basics. How do we really try to, to restore and regain the trust and confidence of the health system? And then it, 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 I, I will put it into two categories. One is the, the, the service providers. So the healthcare workers, frontline healthcare workers, all of those that are involved with ensuring that the services are provided. And then two, those who are actually receiving the services. Now, how do we, how do we assure uh, the confidence and trust of the service providers? In Ebola, I think one of the things that we did was we, we, we really went back and reviewed our infection prevention and control protocols uh and try to really reinforce compliance of those protocols uh we did a lot of trainings of frontline healthcare workers on the protocols um and then um went to the next level of remodeling the infrastructure uh, the doctors on this on this panel all talk about um workflow uh triaging and even looking at the infrastructure itself, um, ICU, um, there are some hospitals that have limited ICUs, uh, let alone ICUs that are specifically built for dealing with uh, cases that are suspected of you know, uh, an infectious disease. Uh, so I think that was another critical part of what we had to put into place. Um, but I'm, I'm also aware that the response can be complex and um, requires significant um, funding to really roll out. Uh, and so, you know, we did the, the protocol. We also went in and had to really look at the uh, surgical procedure and, and guidelines um, um, checklist. Uh, and I, I know uh, the World Health Organization has that as well. And, and I would advise, you know, recommend that, you know, people look at that as well. If you don't have one, you can modify it to your own context as, as, as well. But those were some of the things that we had to put into place. Um, beyond the infrastructure, um, we needed to ensure that, um, we had appropriate testing and diagnosis capabilities, you know, at all of the, the facilities that we were um, uh, reopening or asking people to start to go back to get the services. I think these are really critical for healthcare workers because then they feel safe, as uh, Dr. Negral mentioned, you have to ensure that the healthcare workers or the service providers feel safe to provide the services and, and also reassure those who are coming in to receive these services that they will not get infected when they walk into these health facilities as, as well. Um, we had to invest in um, our quality assurance and quality improvement measures and just overall supportive supervision to ensure compliance and adherence to some of these uh, critical uh, protocols and guidelines that we have uh, instituted. So that was, that was something that um, we did uh, to, to reassure and restore the confidence and trust in the health system uh, from a service provider standpoint. And I think that the, the last piece that I want to share on is uh, the existence or the, the, the provision of medical supplies that is critical i mean like in we've seen it here you know the epidemic 
uh, the, pen, the COVID-19 pandemic, the pressure that it plays on uh, the provision of supplies, PPE and, and, and what have you. Obviously, when you institute your IPC protocol, you want to make sure that healthcare workers or service providers do have what it takes for them to really comply and adhere to um, the protocols and the guidelines. And normally I would say, because a lot of these supplies are, are in, in, in demand, um, they, you know, they're very costly. And so one of the things that we did, and you know, again, this is just a recommendation, was to ensure that we had a buffer stock of supplies for a period of time. We have three, three months of supplies. Now you can go to six months, depending on how much funding you have available to provide these uh, supplies. But you know, between three to six months gives you an ample time to really you know, restart and rebuild that trust and confidence for healthcare workers to continue to go back to, to, to the facility and provide services. I think that the, the second track of that is more with the, those who are seeking services at the, at the health uh, facilities. We had to ensure that we engage communities and I think, you know, uh, Kit, as you mentioned earlier, is, is around the messaging. What kind of messages do we now carve and how we send those messages out? So we had to go back and invest in community surveillance. We had to go back and engage the community structures, you know, um, local authorities. It, 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 it did take a lot of negotiation and conversation with the communities to really reassure them that yes, this Ebola came in, it had a devastating impact on our health system, but we've been able to now, you know, get back on track. We want to encourage you to come to the facilities. When you come to the facilities, here are the things that you want to, you're going to see. You're going to see a change in the way you, you were ushered into the facility, and you're going to see a difference in how healthcare workers are dressed. Don't be afraid of the way you see them and don't get upset if it's gonna take some time, a longer time compared to the time that you initially uh, took when you went to, to the health facility. And, and I think that is really a critical piece of it because once the communities understood that, then you know, they, they started to build, gradually build confidence and trust in its health system to go back and seek care and services at those health facilities. So um, I think just coming out of Ebola, I just wanted to share some of those uh, uh, key you know, lessons uh, with this panel and I'll be happy to um, respond to any specific questions that uh, others may have. Thank you. Great, well, thank you so much. That was uh, very helpful. I uh, especially appreciated what you said about having to build trust again. Also that in many countries, if people can't go to the, the standard medical system, they'll go to uh, alternative medical systems to, to keep, uh, to, to seek care. And you might need to sort of unwind uh, some of that. I do like the ideas of the, the managing of expectations. The health workers will look different or the, you know, the waiting line will be different or the, the waiting room will be different and, and managing those expectations and, and being transparent and, and communicating a bit is, uh, is very important. Well, thank you. That uh, uh, concludes all of our speakers. So we'll now enter the, the Q&A and discussion period. And so we've had a couple of questions come in already, but please type in any additional questions that you have. So the first I'd like to start with is a question for, for Dr. Chu or any of the other panelists on the, the MET scoring system. And if you can give a little bit more context of it and how it's developed and used. Um, sure, I can, I can start to address that. So, I mean, the MET scoring system, which again is to try to prioritize um, which procedures within a hospital system should be going before the other ones, um, was developed by a group of, of U.S. surgeons and, um, you know, the, the scoring system and the point system that they created um, was, was pretty much just validated with their own context. And I think that the, the main question and concern is for our setting 
in LMICs, is that still valid and useful? However, for sure, some kind of system, I, I think, some kind of framework or scoring system could be really helpful in our context. Um, I just think that we need to adapt it more and to simplify it a bit for our own context. But I think that all the points about you know, how much time, the procedure, how much time is spent in theater, what is the risk to the rest of the staff? Is there gonna be need for ICU? How long are they gonna stay in the hospital? Um, that's quite an important factor. Um, the specific disease, you know, if there is a way to objective, objectively state by not doing this procedure, delaying it for two weeks, is it gonna make a big difference? Cause it might, your pandemic may have changed in those few weeks, so can you delay? Um, and then the last point, you know, is the patient's own comorbidities and obviously risk of exposure to COVID. So I think that in, in many hospitals, um, preoperative testing isn't available or the turnaround time is so slow. So then how do we um, triage those patients? How do we assess their risk? So, you know, then I think if they, certainly if they're symptomatic, that would be one thing. Um, and I don't think that in many of us are in the position like Dr. Drosy to get, um, to get um, thoracic CT scans on all of their preoperative patients as an alternative. I thought that was actually quite interesting that that was available more than the, than the, than the testing. Um, but, uh, you know, have they been contacted with other patients that have been, other folks that have had symptoms? And I think that that will end up being the, the sort of triage system or, or evaluation of their COVID risk. But again, I think that many of us are in situations where then how do you isolate that person for a certain number of days before their operation. And I think there was a question in the chat that I'd also address is that it, for emergency pr procedures that aren't life-threatening or limb-threatening in the next few hours, you know, then is it ethical or should we be then preoperative testing all those, especially if you've got a turnaround time of a day or two. So an appendicitis, for example, perhaps can wait a day or two if um, you do have that testing. And I think those are all the unknowns, but I think that um, guidelines are needed because I think that many hospitals um, are not allowing surgeons to do this preoperative testing, but many surgeons are asking for it, um, you know, to assess their own risk for the, to the healthcare workers as well as to the patients. And I think that's something um, as this pandemic progresses, there needs to be guidelines about. Thank you. And it, you know, it actually also brings up the issue that potentially you can do pool testing of some of the patients, like uh, testing five at a time, uh, which might um, enable you to test more people. Uh, another question that I had was about uh, uh, governments or health systems helping uh, hospitals economically regarding surgery, because we know in the, in the US and a lot of private systems around the world, surgery is one of the big money makers for the hospital and subsidizes the rest of the hospital. So have any of you seen um, you know, and so there's the, I think there's the concern that there might be a rush to return to surgery in order to get that income stream going. And have any of your countries uh, addressed that issue? Um, I, I can speak for in South Africa, the private sector, I think, has really, um, I think Dr. Negral also mentioned you because they depend a lot on the income of operations, but oftentimes it's also individual surgeons. So here, surgeons don't work for the hospital; they work for themselves. But they themselves, their own practices, are suffering, as as are the anesthesiologists. But um, some of our health insurance companies here, or we call them medical aids. Um, there's been a negotiation with them that they're actually going to pay some of the healthcare providers, not just surgeons and anesthesiologists, but general practitioners as well, that have had a real reduction in their income. Um, some of a, a proportion of what they earned the year before is just a way to cover their livelihoods and their overheads because the medical aids or the health insurance companies haven't had to pay out as much claims this year because people aren't seeking care. And so they, they've had already budgeted for that. And so that's an interesting sort of question and, you know, raises, I think, other ethical issues about being paid for services that you didn't render. Uh, but again, these are extraordinary times. So I, uh, if I may just uh, add, the, the, the situation uh, in India is that a uh, lot of the public hospitals have taken the overwhelming load of the COVID cases and are unable to start surgery, are not keen to start surgery. Uh, so a lot of patients are being actually pushed to the private sector for uh, early surgery, essential surgery. And that's a problem because many of them cannot actually afford the, the cost. Incidentally, what the government has also done is to cap 
cost in private hospitals because covid patients in private hospitals were being given huge bills so there was a big uproar so it's a very strange situation right now for ordinary people because they have been pushed to the private sector um uh, and the private sector costs have been capped and the private sector is not happy about it so we don't know how it's going to go interesting now that's interesting to hear great and another question that we received is is that of having two pathways for surgical patients and all the equipment involved whether it's the ventilators or the rooms and the beds uh if people could comment on you know how how do you do that if we have limited supplies or if you don't have uh viral filters or have a limited number of viral filters for your your ventilators uh, if i can speak for us we we haven't met this situation before because we don't have this huge number of cases like other countries have so we still have like a um, situation situation under control the hospitals can their capacities can manage the numbers of of patients in private practice or private practice are doing only like a non covid patients so uh, in some public hospitals are like covid hospitals and non covid hospitals so there is no uh, no cross contaminations between uh, uh, no risk of cross contaminations and uh, for supplies we uh, thanks god we never faced the run run out of supplies until now uh, and we hope not to to face it in the future <laughs> Right. Thank you so much. Um another question that we've received is if some of you could uh unpack a little bit more give a little bit more context to the study that showed that one in four uh patients uh covid patients uh died after a surgery. Yeah, so you know, uh, if I can just come in on that. So the uh the the covid surge uh, study is what you're referring to. Uh mm -hmm. largely from I think Europe and uh not america if i'm not mistaken i think uh, one needs to look at it a little in detail uh, number one these were all covid positive patients i think a lot of them were uh, fairly major surgeries and a very elderly population with comorbidities mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that i don't know whether that's going to reflect in the the rest of the world i showed you some data from from india uh, so whether that should be taken as the benchmark figure uh, i am not sure i think it depends on your patient population uh and the type type of surgery but of course we need to keep in mind that uh, you know uh, uh, there is a post op mortality and if I, if i can just respond to the covid pathway question uh so you know we've done that but increasingly we are realizing that patients who are into the non covid hospitals or non covid wards turn out to be covid positive and there's a there's a question which which demands an answer which is we should, whether we should begin to approach this uh, with some kind of universal precautions that we adopted for hiv where you know we just assume everybody's covid positive and get on with the job i don't know what others feel about this Actually, I agree with you. I think in in certain settings where you can't get timely testing, you do have to just consider that everybody's COVID and it's COVID positive and treat them that way, uh, both for their safety, but I think even more so for the safety of the healthcare workers working with them. We had a lot of debates over that in the U.S. with uh, uh, some health facilities wanting healthcare workers in outpatient clinics to not wear any masks at all or just wear a a cloth mask and people of course wanted the highest level protection and wanted the the N95 mask so it certainly did uh did kick off a, a big debate in the US and uh we have another question someone asking uh do you think that the daily the disability adjusted life year could be used as another tool for prioritizing uh for surgeries in the face of limited resources I mean I think that's a that's a great question but I think that kind of question more addresses a little bit of you know the surgical backlog or how important the surgery is in order to improve life expectancy or life productivity and I think Dr. Negral kind of brought that up in you know in terms of like the the, the operation and then the return to um functional ability I do think that that is a little bit of a slippery slope however because um it then instead of judging each person and their health condition um versus that individual risk you know then you're 
kind of putting a value on that person and their condition and, and how much it's going to improve them. But I think it's a valid point because in a sense, the scoring system, the men's is about triage and it is about prioritization. And if you do have a limited resources, um, you know, there, there, there are many factors that go into it. So I, I think it's something to consider. But I think the one thing about the DALIs that's difficult is that the disability um, adjusted life years for surgical conditions has not really been well defined. So I think there are only a few um, conditions and procedures, cleft lip, cleft pot being one of them, but and cataract operations being another. But for many of the other conditions, there isn't really a dalliance right now. And so I think that could also make it challenging to use that. Thank you so much. And uh, Jeff, did you have any questions for the group? So, um, you know, other um, questions that we had was if um, people could, uh, could comment more on, on pediatric patients. I think, Dr. Chu, you mentioned that a little bit, but if anyone else wanted to comment on any special considerations for, for pediatric patients. And for example, are um, parents being allowed uh, into the hospital or, and, you know, what um, areas are they being allowed in or for certain age groups? Yeah, for, for me, I, I keep doing uh, like lift surgery for patients in my practice. So uh, mm -hmm. one one uh, one parents are allowed for with the with the with the child. Like it's the mother. Uh, generally, he, he, she is allowed to stay with the child during the one uh, overnight of hospital, hospitalization. And I try to discharge them if I can by the, the same the same day. Uh, so for me, this is the the only way. The, the only situation that one parents or uh, f members of the family uh, can go for my aesthetic surgery, regular surgery, no, uh, no, uh, no person is allowed and no visits are allowed. Okay, thank you. Did anyone else want to comment on that? Okay, the next question is given the huge backlog, do you plan on sharing the findings uh, with your respective government public health officials and suggest a more nuanced approach uh, to future pandemics? Like how, how will the lessons learned prepare us for continuing surgery during the next pandemic? I, I think um, for me that COVID has really highlighted the fact that surgery was already um, a public good that wasn't really valued and the access to was quite poor. And the, the pandemic has exacerbated that. So I think um, in some way, it's, uh, we can turn this, I mean, they say, you know, don't ever waste a good crisis. So I think that we should turn this around in, in surgical care to try to lobby for um, better access from the, the get-go, because I think that we're now in this situation because we had such a big backlog to start with, and now um, we were forced to reduce even more. Um, you know, and the other, I guess the other, argument or strengthening is for um, anesthetic skills and critical care services. I think that they've sort of always been left out of the discussion about improving surgical care, but now with COVID patients, you know, their skills have been highlighted. And I think you know, that's something also to champion. Yeah, that's I, a very good, oh, sorry, go on. All right. So, you know, I, I just want to reiterate uh, uh, one point which Catherine mentioned, which is that what COVID has done is actually highlighted many of the dysfunctionalities of our systems. Uh, in Mumbai city, for example, there's huge public discussion on how we neglected public hospitals over the years and we allowed a, a huge private sector to go, go grow, which is its own priorities. And I think there's been a lot of rethinking now. Uh, and in that rethinking, uh, what is probably, I hope it happens is the, the public healthcare system uh, will get more funding and uh, may get strengthened. So that's, you can say a, a, a good fallout of the, of, the, of the epidemic, if at all. That's a good point, I agree with you. I see several comments here of people in a number of different countries saying they don't yet have the PPE they need to restart surgery. So uh, uh, that's of course disappointing to hear. And then there's a question saying, in the face of the global scramble uh, for PPE, how will low and middle income countries source PPE required for treatment and for surgery? Like for example, what are, are you know, your countries doing to, uh, to try to uh, procure as much PPE as possible? Right, so I don't know whether uh, any of my colleagues will try to take it, but you know, we started with uh, wearing uh, 
level three PPEs, you know, those almost uh, space suits kind of things. And over time, we, re- we have sort of gone down to uh, level two. And uh, uh, luckily in India, uh, PPEs, at least the N95 mask is now available through hospitals, pretty cheap. We, we wear a face shield. And uh, we, we really managed to now uh, get on with work with that. Uh, uh, so we had problems with PPEs in the first month. Uh, now those problems seem to be less. I think one of the things is uh, the the transmission during surgery. If you avoid going into the OR during uh, during the intubation, uh, uh, transmission from the patient to the surgeon is quite low. Uh, uh, there is now data that it's it's not very high at all. So I think uh, middle level PPEs are usually enough, and we haven't seen. Too many surgeons in India getting infected. I am I'm aware that globally, of course, there have been uh, there have been surgeons who've got got infected. So we've taken a middle path for PPEs. Did anyone else want to comment on that? Yeah, kid. Um, I just I, I I just wanted to add also that um, I think this one of the lessons coming out of this, you know, COVID is that there is, you know. Um, a critical need for global partnership um, that no single country can respond to this exclusively and say by closing their borders and preventing people from leave, from leaving their homes or going across borders is going to um, shield them from the, the pandemic itself. So, um, getting everybody around the table and consolidating our resources and reappropriating those resources to respond, to equip and capacitate the system to respond, I think is going to be critical. And that requires a, a you know, public-private partnership. Uh, like every actors, including those who are manufacturing these supplies, I understand the the economic side of it, but people need to understand that there is a human side attached to this, that if you don't invest and you don't make these supplies affordable, eventually you will have no one purchasing those supplies. And I think this is a critical, I mean, it's not an emotional request, but I I think it's just required of us and and, and I'll, I'll share humanity that we do not exploit the situation and maximize profit at, you know, at the expense of people who cannot afford. Uh, so, so I think that's, that's, that's the one thing I, I will you know, add to, uh, to this. And I, I, I just also wanted to, to put in a quick point, uh, well, two quick points. One, that we're talking about all of the things that are necessary to restart uh, the surgery, but a critical first step in really getting that off the ground is really assessing um, the readiness and preparedness of the facility to actually restart uh, the services. And I think that, that sometimes we take it for granted because we're already deeply entrenched into, we have to respond to the backlog, we know we have to start providing the services without really stepping back and saying, hey, here's our checklist. Have we met this? Have we met that? Have we, do we have this? Do we have uh, adequate blood uh, supplies? You know, do we have? I mean, like everything that is needed. So, really ensuring that you do that and have that kind of findings or the information to inform what kind of intervention remains very critical. Um, as far as obstetric care, one of the things that we did uh, when I worked at Africare in Liberia. Uh, to help the government, even though it wasn't a nationwide um, initiative, but we invested in what we refer to as maternal uh, waiting homes. So the maternal waiting homes were really a lifesaver for expectant mothers because people were afraid to go to the, the health facilities. And so the maternal waiting homes were where expectant mothers came in. We hired a few uh, certified midwives who were there to provide support and for those um, who were ready, you know, to, you know, to give birth, we had them referred, I mean, or transported to um, the health facilities. The mo- many of these maternal wedding homes 
were in close proximity to a health facility. So it was easy for them to go in there, do their, their, their deliveries. And if everything was okay, they just brought them back. And they, you know, is, so the maternal wedding homes also serve as postpartum war uh, for, 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 for mothers. Those that had complications and needed uh, C-section had to stay in there, you know, for a few hours or a day, but then also refer because people were so afraid uh, of staying longer in the health facilities. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I think you raise a good point that we've discussed checklists and guidelines on patients, but we also need a checklist for the facility to make sure the facility is ready to, uh, to reopen. You know, on the issue of the production of masks, um, I think another thing that will change post COVID is previously our supply chains were really narrowing. Uh, for example, with one country, usually China, producing you know, over 80% of the world's supply of, of certain types of PPE. And I think what we're gonna see now is, is more countries uh, trying to become at least partially self-sufficient in that PPE or other medical supplies. I mean, certainly the US has been running out of uh, the testing kit supplies like nasal swab, swabs, you know, the viral medium. Um, uh, so, so I certainly could see countries uh, like India and South Africa, which already have large manufacturing bases, pushing to, to start local manufacture of, uh, of some of this PPE. Okay, are, um, uh, do any of the, um, the panelists have any uh, points they want to make that they, they feel they weren't able to, uh, to make in their original presentations? Okay. I'm checking the questions to see if there are any other questions. Someone has asked um, if we could review a little bit more the categorization of surgeries into elective, semi-elective. Now, we understand it varies, you know, country by country. You know, Dr. Chu said in some contexts, every surgical patient in South Africa is, is you know, semi-emergent, that there is no such thing as, you know, an elective patient. But if uh, some of our speakers could could explore a little bit more how countries can, can think about, you know, elective versus semi-elective and, and how countries, how um, patients fall into those categories. So, you know, if I can just, uh, it, it's, it's a difficult area, but uh, so the way we have done it in, uh, in one of the institutions I work uh, is that, of course, we, it's easy to identify what is emergency. Somebody uh, it's it's a it's a condition where the person would die if you don't offer surgical care within a few hours or so, uh, and that's usually clear. It's also fairly clear to talk about a subgroup of patients who it's really elective. So you have cosmetic surgery, you have maybe bariatric procedures, etc. Now, now the ones in between is where where the problem is, and one. One uh, sort of uh, parameter we used in the early days is that we, we said that what is likely to, what is the natural history of the disease and what is likely to happen if we don't operate? Is there a chance of mortality uh, within the next few months? Um, are there alternative treatments? So we took that as a, as a measure. Mortality, I mean, this is, we are talking of non-cancer. Cancer, of course, is different. Uh, chances of mortality in the next few months in which case they are prioritized. Having said all this, uh, I, I think when you start, uh, you know, there is a mad scramble and, you know, it also pressures from various departments. So, but this, this is some rough ways to, to look at it. Great. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And um, with that, um, uh, I would like to give the floor to uh, Dr. Jeff Ibbotson to, to wrap up, but I would also like to, to thank all the panelists and all, everyone who helped us organize this webinar. And I hope that you'll join us next month when we have a webinar on leadership during the COVID pandemic. Thank you, Kate. And thank you all of the uh, speakers for a, quite an interesting discussion. Um, as you guys have uh, well noted, I think this is a new era of a world that we're living in. I think a lot of these issues are not going to go away and we're going to have to be very dynamic and agile in planning and getting that care that we do need for our patients. And just the fact that so many people are suffering and dying and getting increasing disability because they can't get these uh, surgeries is an enormous burden of illness that the globe is now facing. So Thank you once again uh, from the United Nations, 
UNITAR and the Global Surgery Foundation. Thank you to Operation Smile and Stellenbosch and all the speakers. This has been wonderful. And we look forward to uh, more sessions like this. And a, a special thank you to all the participants and those who uh, participated in the question and answer. Uh, this has been a very good discussion. So from uh, all of us at uh, the UN, thank you very much and have a great day. Keep safe. And until next time, uh, we'll uh, just take care. Okay, goodbye now. <laughs>